Hi, everyone. Um, so um, last time we um, we discussed different sorts of ways of measuring income inequality. Um, we examined the effect of income inequality on health at both the individual and collective levels. And we considered some mechanisms uh, for this effect, including the possibility of social comparison and, um, and social hierarchy. Um, and, and it turns out um, that we, as we saw that the association between income inequality and mortality is considerably stronger than can be accounted for the concavity at the individual effect, at the individual level. So at the end of last time, we were talking about this individual income explanation. Maybe there's a relationship between uh, income inequality and health that's sort of like an artifact of the curvilinear relationship between income and health at the individual level. Um, and so we, we were sort of primarily then focused on these other kinds of explanations, the neo-material environment explanation and the psychosocial environment explanation. Uh, and as we introduced, and we concluded that something else is going on than just this you know, potential artifact. And as we introduced the last time, relative deprivation might produce adverse effects inside people's bodies, the psychosocial effects, and and not just outside people's bodies. And these mechanisms can reinforce each other and can operate, as we said, at different levels of geographic aggregation, larger or smaller, respectively. And yes, a reduction of in income inequality via income transfers improves health as a result of the concave nature of the health curve operating at the individual level. So last time, we talked about, okay, if you take, if here's income and here's health, and this is the relationship at the individual level, if you take money away from this person, this much money away from this person and transfer it to this person. So you go from X4 to X3, you deprive this person of money and you go from X1 to X2, you give it to this person. The loss of health of this person is tiny. The gain in health in this person is large. And therefore on average, if you did that at the global level, you might find that you could improve, um, you could improve uh, 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 health from, uh, from Y1 to, to Y3. I have to look here and catch up with where I'm, uh, where I'm at. Uh, so, so these are the uh, X3 to X2. Ah, so the median here. So if you go from X3 to X2, uh, the average income and the average health the average income is X, the average health is Y sub two, but a transfer here can result in a move from Y sub one to, uh, to Y sub, uh, sub three. I have to look at this labeling. But there's another thing going on here, which I haven't yet mentioned, because another way that reducing income inequality might improve health at the population level would be that such a reduction might shift the whole curve up. In other words, if this is the United States, maybe the health wealth relationship in the United States is shifted up compared to Ghana and, and Sweden is shifted up compared to the United States. Maybe if we reduce inequality, in addition to moving money from one individual to another individual, which might improve average health, if we reduce inequality, maybe we move the whole curve up. That means for any given income level, you have higher health. So you get higher average health because now everyone is living in a more equal society. Maybe there's something about living in a more equal society that's more salubrious, more health promoting. So this is the shifting the curve up idea, or maybe something about living in a more unequal society that makes everyone worse off. So that on any given income, you shift the curve down. Like Ghana, for any given income, you might be your health might be worse in Ghana than from the United States because the society is more unequal. So it's not just about transferring wealth within the society. Something about those transfers could shift the whole curve, let's say, up or down. In other words, another way that reducing income inequality, uh, that reducing in income inequality might improve health at the population level 
would be that such a reduction in inequality might shift the curve up. In other words, something about living in a context with less inequality might change the whole set point of the wealth health relationship for everyone. So the green curve is Sweden and the orange curve is the United States. And for any given income, everyone is better off, let's say in Sweden. Now the argument in essence is that income inequality can work to actually move the curve up or down altogether and not just move individuals along it. We might, and, and the question we might then ask is what might be the mechanisms by which, by which income inequality could shift the curve up or down for everyone? How might that work? And we talked about some neo-material ideas the last time, and I'd like to talk a little bit about some social, psychosocial ones today. So hierarchy and inequality, especially if long-standing and cumulative, can affect individuals' health. And indeed, the point is that hierarchy has always mattered because it did when we evolved in the first place. Our species evolved in hierarchical social groups. We evolved a physiology and a psychology to cope with that kind of hierarchy. That modernity has not pushed that away. That's like part of our human nature. And so the question is, well, to what extent does the operation of those physiological and psychological adaptations, to what extent do those continue to affect us in ways that maybe underlie the kinds of relationships we've been talking about uh, yesterday and today? And in fact, part of the reason that a minimum amount of income is not enough to efface hierarchy and its effects on health is that people have needs beyond basic necessities, beyond merely being above the poverty line. Our needs are not linear. It's not a step function either. It's not like, oh, if I get to this point, then you just step up in some way. And it turns out that these needs should ideally be met if people are to, have, are to be healthy physically and, and mentally. And these needs can be arranged in the famous Maslow's hierarchy, which many of you may already be familiar with. And these needs are important because they help shed light on why the health SES relationship is in fact not a step function. So the idea is, is that all human beings have a set of needs that can be arranged you know, from most basic to most abstract. And at the bottom are physiologic needs for breathing, food, water, sex, sleep, homeostasis, that's like a regular environment, or excretion. Then we have needs for safety of our bodies, of our resources, uh, you know, of our, of our health, let's say, in our property. And then we have a need for love and belonging, you know, for friendship and family and sexual intimacy. People can kill themselves if they lack this, for example. It's not, even if they're well fed and aren't under threat of being killed, the lack of these things is really bad for people. And then they have a need for self-esteem and confidence and achievement and the respect of others or of by others. And finally, at the top level, people have a need for morality and creativity and, and a, a, kind of, a kind of what is called self-actualization, a kind of sense of being a complete person, you know, which sometimes takes a lifetime to develop a kind of comfort in your own skin and a kind of sense of presence in the world. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and, and so it's, it's the potential that you could be deprived of some of these needs and not just the needs at the bottom that might harm your health. So for example, a famous example of this is that if you, if you get into the DC Metro in Washington DC and you travel a distance of 12 miles inbound from Montgomery County, Maryland into inner city Washington, the life expectancy of the local population segment above you as you travel underground rises about a year and a half for each mile you travel. So a poor black man at one end of the journey has a life expectancy of 57 years and a rich white man at the other end has a life expectancy of 77 years, 20 years more life expectancy in that 12 mile move as you move from, from inner city Washington, let's say to, to a suburb. And this difference cannot be explained by our societies not meeting people's physical needs at the bottom of the pyramid. There are very few people in our society who are starving to death, okay? And, or, or lack water or air, you know, or, or these kinds of physiologic needs. 
and relatively few still that lack these things here at the bottom. Most Americans have these things. And yet, as you move this 12 mile distance, you still find this pyramidal effect. And the idea is that some people are lacking in these higher needs, higher up. Something else must be going on, in other words. And what that thing is, is that man does not live by bread alone. There are more needs, it turns out, than, th than those that can be acquired just by having enough income to avoid poverty. And in particular, people have needs for autonomy and psychological integrity and a sense of integration into society. And these are also key as we shall see. In fact, there's a social gradient in health even when we move beyond meeting the lowest needs of people, even after we correct for the problem of lack of food and water. And it, and it has to do with whether or not these other needs higher up on the pyramid are met. And this may be why even as people's material needs are met, we still observe a hierarchy in health status. And this goes back to the mechanism of action of the idea of fundamental causes that we also discussed before. It's why in part these fundamental causes can still operate because it's not just about the, the, the stuff at the bottom, the material needs. These are fundamental processes. So failure to meet these needs may lead to metabolic and endocrine changes that in turn place people at risk for disease and death. And there are fundamental processes related to autonomy and social integration that play a role here. And these processes are socially stratified so that those at the top have more of these features and their health benefits as a result. So so it's it's about the fact that there could be features in our society, structural features that deny people access to these higher order needs and that the denial of those needs then is adversely associated with people's health and that this in some sense part of it at least may be inevitable because we are intrinsically a hierarchical species. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And furthermore, teasing out causation as usual is not easy. Figuring this out is really not an easy thing from a scientific point of view. Well, let me just put a couple of basic biological ideas on the table in addition to what I've said so far to try to set the stage for what I'd like to say later today, a little basic biology, because groups of animals such as primates, often maintain hierarchies that involve dominance. And in turn, this produces market inequalities in access to particular kinds of resources, which can further reinforce the hierarchy. For example, higher ranking primates often eat food from the top of the tree. And that food is often richer in nutrients, gets more sun, it's riper, it's tastier, the fruit at the top, and this further then supports, since they get more nutrients, their dominant status. But sociability in our species and in other species can often counterbalance the stressfulness of such hierarchy. So contrast the images on the left with the images on the right. Here, we use social interactions, these primates, to reduce the impact of hierarchy, whereas here, there are dominance relationships between the primates. Different species are, are different uh, ways. And many of these effects are connected to very basic sociobiological ideas. As the evolutionary biologist Richard Alexander has pointed out, the primary hostile force of nature encountered by human beings is other humans. We really have very few natural predators. And in the modern era, basically none. We're not killed by great white sharks or by lions. We're killed by each other. Other humans are the thing that stresses us out. In addition to other humans being the source of relief for that stress as we're going to see. And in fact, because we share all the same basic needs with other members of our species, they are our most feared competitors and this can be very threatening but they can also be a source of friendship, support, and cooperation. And it can therefore be adaptive, evolutionarily speaking, to form groups. That is, conflict is a constant possibility, even as cooperation is a constant necessity. 
And this has shaped, no doubt, the evolution of behaviors with respect to sociality and our responses to hierarchy and the potential threat from others. So we can think of two contrasting ways to organize human populations, dominance and hierarchy and friendship and equality, both of which have left their mark on our bodies and on our behaviors. Now I need to be clear that I'm not trying to suggest some kind of deep seated biological basis for, um, uh, you know, for a particular political system. But I do want to highlight the fact that we should not be surprised to find that social organization might become embodied, literally, and hence affect the health of individuals. You know, our bodies come to reflect the social, the features of the social world around us. For example, as part of the fight or flight response, our bodies adaptively release hormones which make our blood clotting easier. When you're facing an imminent threat of a fight, someone might attack you or, or stab you or scratch you or bite you, your body prepares for that by pumping out a, a protein called fibrinogen, which is a precursor to fibrin, which is a crucial part of clots. In other words, your body prepares to bleed. It prepares to clot in case you are cut or injured. And that makes perfect sense if you're actually about to engage in a real fight. But if instead you are chronically made to feel like you are about to engage in a fight and your body pumps out this fibrinogen, but you do not actually need the fibrinogen, you don't actually engage in a real fight, that fibrinogen can sort of pile up in your body and form clots where you don't need them, like in your coronary arteries and contribute to your having heart attacks from the fact that you feel under threat and our bodies evolved to respond to that threat in the kind of way that I just described. In other words, hierarchy and inequality, especially if they're longstanding and cumulative, can affect individuals' health in this one illustrative physiologic way. And indeed, the point is that hierarchy still matters in our society because it always mattered. In fact, because it did when we evolved um, in the first place. Okay. And we have an evolutionarily conserved response to adversity that is adaptive in response to physical threats, given that such threats were historically associated with an increased risk of wounding and also of bacterial infection. So in the olden days, you know, we might face threats like these and our brain would interpret those threats and it would result in the differential expression of certain genes and an upgrading in the antimicrobial response and wound repair and therefore as a result in inflammation relief in the past. And now we have other kinds of modern social symbolic or imagined threats. We think we're under threat when our boss yells at us, but actually it doesn't really matter, okay? But we respond the same way, and this can contribute to all kinds of inflammation-related diseases, you know, arthritis or coronary artery disease or gastrointestinal diseases of different kinds. So social symbolic or imagined threats occurring in contemporary social environment activate, in other words, it's a misfire, activate these ancient pathways that evolve for different sorts of threats. And because this system can be activated even by imagined social threats, in other words, in the absence of an actual physical threat, you can get chronic activation of this system. And this can promote the development of several inflammation related conditions, including cardiovascular disease, depression, uh, neuroge neurodegenerative disorders, and even certain cancers. And these psychiatric and physical conditions can cause substantial morbidity and come to dominate modern mortality. Indeed, stressors can be, can be of many kinds and elicit various kinds of bodily res resources, uh, bodily responses. So a stressor, a physical stressor, is an external challenge to homeostasis. That's self-regulation of your body staying in equilibrium. And a psychosocial stressor is the anticipation, justified or not, that a challenge to homeostasis looms. And psychosocial stressors typically engender feelings of lack of control and of predictability and a sense of lacking outlets for the frustration caused by the stressor. 
and both types of stressors activate an array of endocrine and neural adaptations as illustrated, I think, in the reading that I assigned for today. But one of the other things that happens is we adapt to stress. So I stress you out, and then you get used to me, okay? Uh, but why do we do that? Well, it turns out our, our nervous system is wired in this way. This morning, for example, when you, uh, when you, put, on the, you put on socks, raise your hands if you remembered putting on your socks this morning, if you have socks on. Okay, and until I asked you about your socks just now, were you aware of your socks? No, you weren't thinking about your socks. You put them on in the morning, you felt them go on your feet, but now you don't know anything about your socks because your nervous system is wired to detect change in your environment. Once your socks go on, your brain doesn't keep, need to keep getting the feedback. Every second, socks are on, socks are on, socks are on, socks are on, socks are on. No, that would overwhelm you, that would be dumb. You need to know that you're, you successfully put your socks on and then you forget about it. Or always in the class, there are a few people who are afraid of spiders. And if I were present in the classroom, I would ask such an individual to come forward or stand up or otherwise offer themselves as a sacrifice and I would say, imagine that I took your hand and I handcuffed you to a table and I put a spider on your hand and you can literally see the Yaley, there's no spider and there's no handcuff, but you can they start to sweat and they don't like it. Just in, if you're afraid of a spider, just imagining this exercise. And then I say to them, okay, imagine I did this to you and I put the spider on your hand and I just left you there for like an hour. What do you think would happen? And they say, eventually I'd get used to it. You know, like, yes, I would, my anxiety level would decline, okay? So you, you have this big stress response and then your anxiety level uh, declines. But not if I keep doing it to you again and again and put your socks on and off, on and off, take the spider on and off, on and off. Chronic and repeated activation of the stress response by chronic psychosocial stressors, such as constant close proximity to an anxiety pro producing member of our own species can increase the risk of numerous diseases or exacerbate pre-existing conditions. In other words, having low social rank can be stressful in this way. Moreover, as Angus Deaton, the Princeton economist put it, the degree to which low rank is harmful to an individual is likely to depend on the number of people of higher rank because each such person is in a position to deliver the threats, insults, enforced obeisance or ultimate violence that generates stress. Individuals who are insulted by those immediately above them insult those immediately below them, generating a cascade of threats and violence through which low ranked individuals feel the burden, not just of their immediate superiors, but of the whole hierarchy above them. And this is part of the reason that low ranks or statuses can convey more stress. And the lower you are, the more stressful it is. Now, keep in mind what I'm talking about here is the kind of sense of low rank or being socially subordinate to others that's got nothing to do with whether you have enough food to eat or a roof over your head, right? We're higher up in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And you feel that burden when you're, when, uh, when you're, uh, when you're abused by those above you you, you have less opportunities for feelings of social integration or self-actualization and so on that are these higher needs that I discussed before. And an important thing to recognize is that rank or status is relative. It's not an absolute concept. Therefore, a link between status and health suggests the importance of relative standing for health. We're not talking about how absolutely rich you are or how absolutely how many assets you have. We're talking about your relative standing. Rank is intrinsically relative. And this recognition that rank can matter therefore, helps us to explain why relative standing might affect your health. And in fact, it's very hard to totally eliminate relative standing, partly because it seems to be biologically hard hardwired within us, we care about relative standing, and partly because the natural lottery is inherent. In other words, it's inevitable that some people will be born with more desirable traits than others. And we appear to be evolved to care about that. And so we can't escape, you see, this invidious impact of rank on our experience of the world and therefore of our relative standing 
on our objective health. Our relative standing can affect our absolute health. It's not just our absolute standing that affects our absolute health. And humans have very clear ideas about what their relative standing is and what it means to be relatively deprived of desirable attributes or goods. This is the canonical formulation by W.G. Runciman from 1966, the theory of relative deprivation. We can roughly say that a person is relatively deprived of X when he does not have X, he sees some other persons as having X, he wants X, and he sees it as feasible that he should have X. This is what it means to be relatively deprived. Now let's look at some results from humans regarding the possible impact of relative deprivation. And I'm gonna put you guys through some classroom exercises today. Let's see when they're coming up, okay. So this is uh, taken from your readings. This is Michael Marmot's work, The Social Status or Ladder. He says, he sort of produces a kind of metric. He says, think of this ladder as representing where people stand in our society. At the top of the ladder are the people who are the best off, those who have the most money, most education and best jobs. At the bottom are the people who are the worst off, those who have the least money, least education and worst jobs or no jobs. Place an X on the rung that best represents where you stand on the ladder. And then you can literally show people a ladder with 10 rungs. You can mark it, the top is the best off, the bottom is the worst off. And you ask people to put an X where they judge themselves to be. I could ask you guys to do that, for example, and, and you'd mark off where you thought you were. And then you can look at how this self-perceived status on the ladder is associated with various health problems. For example, as Marmot did, in male British civil servants. They're all men. They all have jobs, secure jobs. They work for the British civil service. They're all in Britain. They're all in one of the richest countries in the world. They all have access to the National Health Service. They've got terrific health care. And now we say to them, what's your subjective status rank? And they rank themselves. And now we check and see what health problems do they have? And lo and behold, we found that the, uh, that the, that the average health status of people I'm sorry, the, uh, the, uh, is this the percentage? Yes, I think this is the percentage of people. So the percentage of people with the subjective health, let me just make a note of this because I can't remember what this is the percentage of. So for example, we might say that people that rank themselves the highest they have a 3.6% of them will have angina, that's heart pain. Whereas people at the lowest, almost 10%. Uh, diabetes, the same gradient. Depression, 10% of people at the top might have depression compared to 43% of people at the bottom and so on. Or their perceived health, this is uh, you know, the percentage that uh, feel their health is good uh, compared to their subjective status rank. Again, you see a gradient. And these results actually show several things. They show, first of all, that subjective social standing is important. Second, that these gradients are continuous for numerous health measures along the whole uh, gradient. In other words, it's not a step function. It's not like, oh, you know, only those people at the bottom feel really bad. Even the difference between a one or a two and a three or a four is significant. And finally, as I said, this is observed even amongst male British civil servants who face no material stressors in terms of food or shelter or medicine or anything like that. Now, of course, these results don't clarify the causal order. They don't tell us, you know, uh, which comes first, the health problem or the subjective rank. But nevertheless, there's, they, these are powerful indicators that the relationship here is not a step, is not a step function. You know, it's linear. And data such as these, which I think I've shown you before, uh, show that being poor is associated with greater mortality and diminished prospects of survival. And no doubt being very poor is very bad for one's health. So for example, this shows the household income percentile. There are a hundred dots here. And this is the expected age at death for 40 year olds. And you can see that, that women live longer than men. Uh, so at every income percentile, women live longer. It's better to be a woman. 
And, uh, but the gradient is steeper. The slope is steeper in men. So income makes a difference to women, but it makes an even bigger difference to men. And so this is where the richest men live, their expected age at death. If they're 40 years old, the top 1% of men can expect to live to be 87 or something. And all the way down here, when you get to like the fifth percentile of men, a 40 year old man can expect to live to be 77. So about 10 years lower. And right down at the bottom three percentile points, it is a very steep as if there were in fact a step function right at the very beginning for those at the very, very bottom. And now this may or may not seem obvious to you, but why should this gradient be continuous? Why isn't it a step function, for example? Why should the difference, for example, between earning $50,000 and $60,000 or between $200,000 and $300,000 matter? Why should people who earn 60 grand instead of 50 grand, why should they have better health? What is it about being a little bit higher on this hierarchy? You're not able to like buy that much more to keep you safe. Or why should it matter if you earn a million dollars versus $1.2 million? It's not like the person earning 1.2 is really that much better able to buy things that make them healthier. Um, so why, how does that happen? This is incidentally, before I proceed, another example uh, of this gradient in a large uh, American sample. Uh, this study examined functional health status in over 330,000 Americans who are older than 55 across the full socioeconomic spectrum. And there was a social class gradient showing that respondents with higher incomes have lower levels of functional limitation, you know, inability, sort of some disability, regardless of how far removed they are from poverty. Uh, once again, this shows the poverty line. Uh, you know, are you very poor or you're not very poor? Uh, you know, you're rich uh, for men and for women and by age. And, you know, generally these things slope downwards along the whole gradient. So the richer you are, the better and better you are in terms of your, uh, you know, probability of being uh, disabled. So again, the, the basic point here is that it seems to matter across the whole gradient, which is a bit, you know, why is that? Now, there are a number of possible explanations for this gradient. It could be that relative differences in status might somehow translate into absolute differences in life chances by affecting two key items in humans' needs. It might affect our autonomy and it might affect our social integration. So the idea is, is that if you're lower ranking, you get less social integration. So we convert this relative standing measure, this ranking measure, which is always relative, not absolute. If you're lower ranking, which is lower relative standing, you now have less opportunity to get social integration or less opportunity to get autonomy, which therefore, since you have less of that, you get less health. And we can translate this relative standing into an absolute difference in the amount of autonomy you can have or the amount of social integration you have. So I am relatively richer than you are. That means I get more social integration and autonomy. And because I get more of those, then I am absolutely better off in terms of my health. I get, I live longer than you in some material way. And as economist Amartya Sen points out, it may not be what one has that is important. It may be, but what one can do with what one has that is important. Hence a person's relative position on a scale of income may translate into an absolute position on what he calls capabilities. So even though poor people in the United States have many times the wealth of those in other countries. If you're a poor person in the United States, your absolute wealth is much greater than if you're a rich person, you know, in Niger. A poor person in the United States may still have shorter lives because they cannot do as much with their money because they suffer from a lack of autonomy and of social integration because they are less able to meet higher needs on Maslow's list. So even though a poor American is absolutely richer than a rich person in a poor country, they're at the bottom of the relative standing here. And this is what harms them. 
In other words, it may not be what one's position in the social hierarchy per se that is the problem. It is what this position means for what a person can do in a given environment that is material. It is the extent to which position affects opportunities for higher level needs on Maslow's pyramid. And this link can perhaps be broken by compensating for hierarchy, by equalizing even if we cannot eliminate the consequences of hierarchy and perhaps by counterbalancing the natural and social lottery. For example, lower status can lead to low participation in social interactions and less reciprocity. And these might be associated then, as I've been saying, with worse health. But social participation is not merely something that high status individuals acquire or make for themselves. Societies can, as a whole, also foster it or control it. Think about the differences across societies in whether widowed elderly people are left alone. Think about how some societies, their neighbors care about such people or the extended family feels an obligation of such people. So if you're a poor widowed elderly person in one society, you nevertheless have opportunities for social integration because of the culture and institutions in that society. And it's those cultures and institutions that meliorate, that reduce the adverse impact that otherwise would have obtained in some other society. This relates to an idea called social capital that I've alluded to before and that I'll return to in a couple of lectures. Okay, so let's do a little exercise with you. Uh, Maggie, I can't see all the students. I don't know if you can, but I'd like you to help me count because we don't have clickers. We don't have clickers. Yeah, if folks could use the hand raising button that'll help with the counting. Right. So I want you to use a hand raising button and Maggie, just get an approximate sense of percentage, okay? So I'm gonna ask you students a question now. Here's a question. Which would you prefer? Each of you is gonna to have to make a choice between world A and world B. If you're in world A, your current annual income is $50,000 and others earn $25,000. Or you could be in world B and your current annual income is $100,000 and others earn $250,000. And you can assume equal purchasing power in, in, in A and B. Which world would you prefer? I would like you guys to indicate, every one of you has to make a choice. Would you rather be in world A or B? Okay, raise your hand for A. About half. Okay, so half of you would rather be in A. Let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can, I'd like to try to talk to the students about this. Let me see if I can uh, figure out how to make this work. Uh, let me see if I can uh, get the students here. How do I get, oh, I need to stop sharing. Let's see, stop share. There we go. Okay, so who's someone who picked A? Half of you picked A, I need a volunteer. Someone tell me who picked A? All I'm going to ask you is why you picked A. Okay, Mira, Maria, why'd you pick A? Yeah, I picked A because I feel like if um, everyone else is making like 2.5 times as much money as I was, like they would probably be buying a lot of things. Um, and then I'd be like, oh my gosh, to fit in, maybe I need to buy these things too, but maybe I can't really afford them because of my income. Whereas um, if other people had the same amount of money or less money than me, um, then they probably wouldn't be buying as many things and then I wouldn't need to feel like I would have to buy them either. Okay, so you said you'd rather be absolutely worse off. You chose to earn 50 grand instead of 100 grand because you wanted to be the top dog. You didn't want to be, have other people. So you chose relative standing over absolute standing. Who made, who chose world B? I need someone to explain to me. Someone else that chose world B, half of you chose world B. So someone explain to me why. Come on. Okay, Adam, why'd you pick world B? You chose world B. Was that an accident, Adam, or am I cold calling you? Uh, yeah, I, can, I, can, I can chime in happily. Okay, did you pick world B? Um, I would want more information, to be honest. No, no, you can't anymore. <laughs> I want it. You don't care I want it. anymore. You got to pick world A or B. 
if I'm going to go into a different world, I need like a little more, you know what I mean? I need a little. Which one did you pick, A or B? I was on the fence. Okay, someone else who picked B. The other Adam, Adam VL, did you pick B? That is the VL. Same person. Oh, VL, you have two, you're, you're, you're in I'm your- in two. I'm in twice. So I can be, but one of me is in one and the other is in one. <laughs> okay, come on guys, help me out here. Why did you pick, someone else pick B? Why did you pick B? It's not a hard, it's not a trick question. Everin. Everin. I, I feel like it's a similar reason of why I picked here over like in-state state schools. I, I feel like I enjoy the competition. I'm not sure like what the extended details of, you know, world B are, but I, I don't see it as much as uh, they have that. I don't as much as, uh, I don't know, it's motivating for me to get to a step where they are. Okay, that's a good explanation. Chris, you have something you want to add to that? You pick B? Yeah, I pick B. Um, mostly, I guess my first thought was that 25000 is not really a livable income. So you were, you were willing to be, so long as you were absolutely better off, you were willing to be at the bottom of the pile. Okay, there's nothing rocket science about this. That was, in fact, the, the question. Okay, so let me, let's go on. It's not, there's no trick questions here. I'm just sort of getting you to think about this topic. Let's see if I can now uh, go on here. Let's see, slideshow, presenter view. So uh, this, this example is taken from this paper that's shown here at the bottom. And, uh, and, in, the, uh, and in the yellow is what uh, in the original paper people chose. And uh, in red is what your classmates last year chose. So last year, many more of you preferred A than B. This year it was about half and half. Maggie can take a note. I can use you guys as a guinea pig for next year. So, um, so Yaleys, they, they really care about relative standing, Yaleys do. They, you know, they really want to be top dog, even if they're absolutely worse off. All right, let's look at another example from the same survey. Your physical attractiveness is a six. And everyone else has an attractiveness of a four. This is on a 10 point scale. Or your physical attractiveness is an eight and everyone else has a physical attractiveness of, uh, of 10. World A and B, those are the two worlds. Adam, you have to pick. You can't all the information you get. You don't get to more information. Who, I'm gonna ask you now to raise your hands if you'd rather be an A or a B. Go for A. Who votes for A? Okay, and who votes for B? So A is, is very, A is very popular. Okay, so someone to tell me why did you pick A? Who picked A? Come on, it's not hard. Just tell me why you picked A, someone. Raise your hand. Kate, why did you pick A? No, Kate is not raising her hand. Uh, I picked B. Oh, okay, I'll get to you. Okay, Kate, why? No, I'll get to you in a minute. Stand by, Kate. Uh, and turn on your video if you can. There we go. Okay, who picked A? Someone who picked A, why'd you pick A? Come um, on. Uh, Deborah, well, are you raising your... Oh, David, go ahead. Well, I, I, just, I just kind of blurted it out. Um, I just think that if beauty... Uh, with beauty specifically, if everyone is at a certain level, except for me, like the beauty standard will fall, except for me, the like... You're a six and everyone else is a four. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so the beauty standard is a four. And I just happen to be unbelievably beautiful because there's no other compare. There's no sevens, eights, nines. Yeah, that's, that's, the one to 10 is, is, is exists the scale, but you're you're choosing to be a six because everyone else is a four. And what's the benefit? Everyone else, they're like, no one has a better option than me, even okay. though I'm not. not the best options. Oh, you can have any option you want. All right, Kate, why did you pick the other one? Um, at first, I liked A more, but then when I thought about it, like, if you want to, like, find a partner, like, it, it's probably better if you're an 8 and the whole rest of the world is a 10. Um, yeah, that's the only, like... Well, I know. You think if you're an 8 and the rest of the world is a 10, you think you'll have an easy time finding a partner? <laughs> no, I don't know. I just... If you're a 6 and everyone else is a 4, then maybe you're just, like, never happy. I don't know. If you're shallow. Okay, other I, other people who picked, thank you. That's not a bad explanation. Other people who picked B, why'd you pick B? Half a, yes, uh, Eamon? Uh, sorry, my camera is broken right now, so that's why it's not on. But like the idea is that in regards to relationships, if you're ugly and someone gets in a relationship with you, 
you know, it's not for superficial reasons like beauty. So you picked world B because if you're in an eight, if you're able to get into a relationship, then you can think, oh, they really love me. I have never, I've never heard that answer before. That is a great answer. Uh, usually what I hear is people say, you know, I pick B because if you're an A, yes, like David, you're a six, you can have all the partners you want, but you're only having sex with fours, uh, which, you know, whereas, <laughs> which is not such a great outcome. Some people reason, apparently not David. Uh, okay, so, so, but you should begin to beginning to get, begin developing the insight. There's something different about the attractiveness scale than the income scale. And one of the things that you're beginning to realize is that, um, uh, let me just get the slides back on here. Hold on. And these are the results from the original study. 75% picked A and 25% picked B. Last year we had this. And I think this year we had about the same thing. I think A was more popular than B this year, if I remember. It was. It was. And so the preferences you see for relative versus absolute standing depend in part on what aspect of status we are considering. So on the one hand, some previous students had argued, have argued, for example, I'd rather get the last pick of the eights than the first pick of the fours, right? That in a competitive situation, you know, maybe you'd rather be a six, that, you know, whether you might want to be an A. On the other hand, it depends on what you're getting. Maybe you want to be a B. So there are different kinds of pros and cons to this type of a situation. Okay, let's look at another example. And in fact, I think Severin mentioned this already. Would you rather be the top student at the nearest community college to where you grew up or be an average student at Yale? You're gonna pick. Okay, these are your choices. You can be the top student at the nearest community college where you grew up or you can be an average student at Yale. All right, Maggie, do the survey. Go for A. So some people would rather be the top student in the nearest community. Now, of very course, few people chose that. Very few, and that's the typical response. Last year, 0% chose that and 100% chose this. Now, of course, all of you that said you would choose A, you could have chosen A. In fact, I'm sure you could have got chosen A, and yet you did not. You chose B, okay, and you're stuck with me as a result. Uh, you know, asking you these crazy questions. Okay, here's one more. Think carefully now. Uh, which would you prefer? You could have four weeks of annual vacation and everyone else has five weeks, or you could have three weeks of annual vacation and everyone else um, has two weeks. Four weeks of annual vacation, everyone else has five, or fewer weeks, three weeks of annual vacation, and everyone else has two. Go for A. Okay. That's popular. And B? Okay. So who, who picked A and would like to tell me why did you pick A? Someone, Gabrielle. Gabrielle, are you answering? Gabrielle, why did you pick A? You're on mute. Oh, sorry. I picked A because um, I don't see the weeks as, as much a sign of status, uh, but rather sort of a good that I want more of. Yeah, you're saying, you know, I care about absolutely how many weeks of vacation I get. And I don't care what the rest of the world is doing. I want four weeks of vacation more than three. Okay, and that's the more popular choice. Who picked three weeks of annual vacation over two? There were four or five of you. Someone tell me why you made that choice. These are preferences, guys. There's no right or wrong answer. You're entitled to have this preference. I think someone called Kip or Kai had made a B choice. I'm going to call on that person. No one wants oh, no, to. Had... Yeah. Oh, sorry. I had raised my hand for A, and then I wasn't sure if we were lowering it. So you would rather pick, or Oscar? Does Oscar you want to defend or explain choice B? Why did you pick three weeks of vacation? You want everyone else to suffer. They should all have two weeks. 
<laughs> and you you'll get utility from that why you you're muted yeah, yeah. so i guess it's not <laughs> i don't want it to be like I'm, I'm a bad person or anything i guess in my mind um it was literally nothing more complicated than the fact that for me i think like a sweet spot is like three weeks for vacation and the thing is is that like when i know other people have more vacation than i do i'm, I'm always like oh no you know i wish i wish i had just as much or something like that but again this is a personal preference thing and it's just me being honest <laughs> nothing <laughs> Your set points at three. You're quite happy with three weeks, and um, uh, and therefore, um, you know, you if you had three weeks, you're happy. But you're kind of a little upset if people have more if they're enjoying it, even if you don't want more. So why don't you get the three that you want? And it doesn't matter what other people have, especially if they have less. Something like that. It's something on those lines. Yeah. All right, that's fine. Uh, that is, in fact, I can't remember where I just ended the slides. Here, let's go. Let's go again with share screen. I hate this stupid toggling back and forth. It's driving me nuts. But this is the one we're in now. Presenter view. Uh, and in fact, that is the more popular choice. Uh, most people realize what's going on in this situation. And one of the explanations for this compared to, for example, the, you, the flipping of your preferences with respect to the income choice and the um, attractiveness choice is that you realize most of you do, or most of you feel, it's not a realize, most of you feel that vacation is not a competitive good. In other words, while, while vacation days like money and appearance are desirable, having more vacation than others doesn't confer any competitive advantages. Having more money than others or having more beauty than others can confer a competitive advantage with respect to others. Having more vacation days doesn't necessarily do that. So. So, so, um, so this is this. All of these examples are meant to illustrate the notion of capabilities that Amartya Sen that I mentioned earlier. How you translate uh, absolute dif or relative differences into absolute differences in capabilities. All right, let's keep going. In some cases, though not really the ones we've been considering so far today, such preferences can arise merely from group solidarity, from what is known as in-group bias. Humans are very prone to this, and their affiliative instincts can be elicited in the most minimal ways. So which of these would you choose? You got to choose again. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Is a hot dog a sandwich, yes or no? Who picks yes? So how is that, Maggie? Maybe 20 points? Uh, like a quarter, a little uh, less. All right, so about a quarter of you think the hot dog is a sandwich. And I'm gonna assume that the remainder of you think that a hot dog is not a sandwich, okay? So you all have a preference as to whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. Does everyone understand what I've asked them of, of them so far? Okay, you've formed an idea. Is a hot dog a sandwich or not? All right. Now I'm gonna ask you what you prefer, okay? Now you have to think again. You can either, now in, in, in a classroom setting, sometimes I do this for real with real financial stakes, but we can't do that right now. And there's some other things I do too, but we can't do that. It was a damn pandemic. You can either give $3 to everyone who agrees with you about whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not, and $4 to everyone who disagrees with you, or you can give $2 to everyone who agrees with you and give $1 to everyone who disagrees with you. So this is a, regardless of whether you think a hot dog is a sandwich or not, you formed yourselves into two groups now, those that believe the hot dog is a sandwich and those that do not believe the hot dog is a sandwich. And now you're making a choice about how to allocate resources. Who's gonna pick A? Maggie, what uh, what uh, about what percentage do we get? Twenty five percent pick A, and who picks B? So so you guys have fallen into a little trap of mine, all of you, not just the A's or the B's, which is the astonishing fact that you even have a preference over this. I was able to cultivate in you a sense of group solidarity 
and group identity, where you were willing to treat your own group and other groups differently, simply based on whether you think a hot dog is a sandwich or not. The most stupid, arbitrary of decisions. And some of you, based on that, you say, ah, people who agree with me, I will give them less money than other people, just so we can have more money, or more money than other people, just so we can have more money. The point here, and this is a sort of a second or third order point, is that once the groups, this is known as the minimal group paradigm, that I'm able to cultivate a sense of group. Notice I haven't cultivated a sense of group in you based on race, gender, class, religious affiliation, sexual identity, none of the other high level groups that our society often talks about. We're talking about groups defined by whether you think a hot dog is a sandwich or not. And based on me cultivating that little sensibility in you, you're now willing to allocate resources differentially. People really favor their own groups, sometimes to their own detriment over this trivial difference. In other words, we will harm our absolute interests in order to help the relative standing of our group, even one defined by the most stupid of attributes. Now let's go back to the ladder. So which would you pick? If I showed you a ladder this way, A versus B, I'm going to assume that all of you are going to pick A. It's better to be at the top than at the bottom. Now, which would you pick, A or D? Raise your hands if you'd pick A, and then I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands if you'd pick D. Go for A. What do we get, Maggie? Mm, 40%. Okay, so maybe 40% pick A, and 60% pick D. Okay, here's another choice. Would you pick A or E? So about half of you are willing to be at the top of the bottom ladder. You'd be a little bit worse off than D. D is a little bit better off absolutely than A, but much worse off relatively than C. And now I'm letting you choose between A and E. You can be at the top of this bottom ladder or you know halfway up or a third of the way up on the top ladder. Who picks A? All right, lots of you still wanna be at the top, absolutely even worse off than E. And how many of you pick E? And others of you pick E. All right. And now what would you pick? A or D? or F. <laughs> and the idea here is that this is Ghana, this is the United States, and this is Sweden. And there's a further advantage to being F compared to D, and both of them are better than being A on the absolute scale, at least. So let's look at some additional evidence for this idea. Let me just see how much more I have to cover because I've got uh, 15 minutes left and then I'll do some questions. I think we'll have a little time for questions. All right. One hypothesis uh, flowing from the observations we made earlier about the biology of hierarchy and stress in primates is that relative deprivation will matter to individual's health. And the idea, again, is that it's not so much one's absolute deprivation, if any that matters, but one's relative deprivation. And relative deprivation is the following. The idea that low income or status relative to a reference group can affect your health. And, rel and relative deprivation is the difference between your own income, Y sub I, and the, and the average reference group income, given that income is greater than Y sub I. In other words, your reference group is people that are richer than you, and we're gonna compare your income to the average of the people that are richer than you. Relative deprivation is an upward looking individual level measure that depends on the income of others. The richer your reference group, the higher your relative deprivation. And relative deprivation describes an individual standing. It is different for each member of the group. Each of you has a different relative deprivation. 
inequality is the same for the entire group, it describes the distribution of income, but relative deprivation is different for each member of every group. And here's the math for one measure of relative deprivation, something known as the Yitzaki index. And what you do is, is you take for a person I with income Y sub I, who is part of reference group with N people, you look at everyone's, for, for all Y sub J greater than Y sub I, in other words, for all people who, whose income is higher than yours, you subtract every rich person's income, every person richer than yours income minus your own income, you sum that, over J and you divide it by N where N is the size of the whole population, not just the people that are richer than you. So Warren Buffett is not deprived by billions of dollars compared to Bill Gates, but rather by the difference in their wealth divided by the size of the American population or the global population. So if their wealth differed by $3 billion, and there are 300 million people in the United States, we would say that Warren is relatively deprived compared to Bill by $10. There's only one person richer than, than Warren, that's Bill. We subtract the difference in their wealth, it's $3 billion, we divide it by 300 million people, and we say actually Warren is not that relatively deprived compared to, to Bill Gates, okay? Now, as an aside, it's also possible to compute, this is very depressing, and I usually don't teach this, it's possible to compute a downward looking measure where we can think of your relative, not your relative deprivation, but your relative like ascension. And we look at how many people you are richer than and who you can step on. You know, it's a downward looking index of how many people you can step on and that might lift you up, let's say. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about relative deprivation, the upward looking measure. And here are some examples giving the relative deprivation for people with different incomes and with reference groups chosen by location and age. So this shows the reference group is, are you in Hidalgo, Texas or New York? And what is your age? Are you a 21 to 25 year old in Hidalgo or a 21 to 25 year old in New York? If you earn $25,000 and you are a, in this age group in Hidalgo, your relative deprivation is $4,725. But in New York, it's higher, it's 17,374. And the reason is obvious that in fact, people are richer in New York, earning 25 grand in New York doesn't put you as high up on the totem pole as earning 25 grand in Hidalgo. If you earn 100 grand in, in Hidalgo and you're 46 to 50, you're relatively deprived by a small amount. You're one of the top earners in Hidalgo, but in New York, you're relatively still deprived by $65,000. It's not so great. And the idea is that one's relative deprivation, one's standing in the hierarchy is roughly the same if one earns $25,000 in Hidalgo or $100,000 in New York. So in Hidalgo, if you're a college grad and you earn 25 grand, you're not relatively deprived very much, just 47, 50, 25. And here you have to earn a hundred grand in New York before you have the same relative deprivation. You can do about as much with 25 grand in Hidalgo as a hundred grand in New York in terms of your capabilities. This is translating the absolute amount of money, 25 grand or a hundred grand into a standing of what you can do with that money given what's happening around you, given where you are uh, in the hierarchy. And here is how relative deprivation, again, measured at the individual level, is associated with various health outcomes. So this shows relative deprivation and health outcomes and uh, predicted percentages based on whether you're depressed, anxious, I'm sorry, uh, uh, with respect to whether you are depressed, anxious, or rate your health as poor or fair. At baseline, these are the percentages. If you reduce your de relative deprivation by this amount, you're uh, less likely to be depressed, less likely to be anxious, and less likely to rent your hair poorly. And if I increase your relative deprivation, all those outcomes get worse. In other words, it's not just your absolute wealth that is associated with these health outcomes, it's your relative deprivation. In fact, other work done by these same investigators suggests that even after controlling for individual income, 
and a number of covariates, relative deprivation appears to have a large and statistically significant impact on the probability of dying. It's just not, not just how much you earn that matters, it's where you are in the hierarchy that can affect whether you live or die. Overall, the relative deprivation effect is meaningful and the effect of a one standard deviation increase in relative deprivation appears to increase mortality by 39%. Similarly, those that are relatively deprived also are more likely to have high blood pressure, smoke, be overweight, not wear their seatbelts, and so on. This is a completely different measure than the other kinds of stuff we've been discussing so far in this class. This is all relative deprivation, it's hierarchy. It's not whether you're rich or poor, black or white or urban or rural or Catholic or Protestant or any other damn thing. It's where you stand in the hierarchy. I'd like to close by putting a face on some of these differences using the remarkable photographs taken by Mark Leita in his book, Created Equal. On the left is a homeless man, Phil Dombrowski from LA, California, and his sign says, anything could help. And on the right is real estate developer, Gerald Springer from Houston, Texas. On the left is company president, William Scott from Boston, Massachusetts. And on the right is a janitor, Walter Johnson from Neptune City, uh, New Jersey. Just the different life ways, right? On the left are Amish teenagers, Janie Zook and Sam Stoltzfus from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on the right are punk teenagers, Otto Bixler and Brianna Holland from Hollywood, California. And this idea can also be used in a sort of counter marketing campaign that we saw a few lectures ago, addressing the workings of the social lottery. And here it says, your skin color Here it says, your skin color shouldn't dictate your future. Of course it shouldn't. And look at the poignancy, look down here. Under this baby, there's this red bucket with these, uh, these uh, uh, gloves as well as the little outfit that this little girl has on her. Your skin color shouldn't dictate your future. It's moving, troubling and relevant to contemplate the workings of the natural and social lotteries that assign us not only absolute, but also relative rankings and relative standings in our society. And these relative rankings and relative standings are relevant to individual and population health. And all these observations we have been making suggest a connection between health policy and economic policy, which we'll revisit later in the course. Poor people die younger and are sicker than wealthy people, and such effects are seen with many measures of socioeconomic status. If the primary determinant of health is money, is economic redistribution therefore sound health policy? And if health and wealth are both important elements of human welfare, what does it mean if those deficient in one are also deprived in terms of the other? And should we seek to address the workings of both the social and the natural lotteries? And how, in fact, might we do so? Okay, any questions from today before I let you go? I'm in so for the thought experiments that we did earlier, did we were we supposed to make the choices knowing that we could have made the other choice? Because I mean, like if I had to choose between three or four vacation weeks, regardless of how many others have, I choose four. But if I if I knew if I chose three and I knew that I could have chosen four, I probably would have felt bad that I didn't choose. Yeah, but four. but you're asking me. If, if, if I asked you, would you rather have 100 grand or 25 grand, you would, everyone would pick 100 grand, I suppose. Maybe if you were a masochistic monk or something. Or if I asked you if you'd rather have four weeks or three weeks, okay, maybe some of you think, you know, after the third week of vacation, I hate it. I really don't want that fourth week. It really ruins the vacation when I have that extra week. 
maybe some of you would feel that way. Most of you would not. So the, the point of the exercise I'm in is to put into tension the absolute versus relative standing. And, oh. and, and as you see, there's a lot of variation in opinion. There isn't a sort of a right answer, although each of them cultivate a different intuition in you. And I hope that by the vacation example, you understood at least one key difference, which is whether or not those relative standings matter depend in part on whether you can translate them into sexual or monetary or other opportunities in a way you could not, for example, with vacation days. Okay. Or, the, or the stupid example with a hot dog and a sandwich where you seem to care about what your own group was getting. You had a kind of fealty to your own group, which really wasn't material to the situation at hand. You should, be, you should have wanted more dollars regardless of whether some of your enemies, you know, some of these other people thought the hot, had a different opinion than you about a hot dog being a sandwich or not. Oh, I see, thank you. Other questions or comments? Severin? Yeah, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but I was wondering if you can go into more depth about how we can think about like um, minimizing those differences that you spoke of that like, if you are in a society and it's like, you're, you're relatively deprived, how, how can you minimize the risks? So, so here's the thing. I've been telegraphing this idea for many lectures the egalitarian impulse that imagines that we can efface all difference is, is incompatible with biology. There is a natural lottery. There just is. It's, an, it's, it's the way nature works, okay? Now, that doesn't mean we should not, in a civilized society, not try to uh, minimize the impact of the natural lottery. So if people are born blind, I want to live in a society that provides for people who are blind. I want to live in a society that I'll spend money to have you know, a talking signposost and uh, braille books in libraries and whatever can be done to help redress the, you know, being randomly assigned the, the state of being born blind. Even though you could argue that I, we had nothing to do with that natural lottery, it's just a natural lottery. Why should we do anything about it? No, I would like to live in a society like, like that. That's the natural lottery. But as Jefferson argued, you know, many lectures ago now, the social lottery is yet again something different, right? The social lottery says, no, it, this comes from the society. We unequally treat you know, black people and white people, or we unequally treat men and women, or whatever the hell it is, we unequally treat them. That's the workings of the social lottery. And there, I think we really have a, a duty to try to redress that, right? I don't think that you can make a moral argument for the acceptability of the social lottery, right? So, so on the one hand, I don't think, for example, if you're born beautiful, there's some science fiction stories, maybe you read them in high school, where beautiful people were deliberately mutilated so they wouldn't be attractive. That's just dumb, right? I'm, we're not arguing for that. But I do think that, you know, for example, you could, you know, an inheritance tax is something different, you know? Why should you get to inherit the money of, now there's, this is actually complicated. I don't wanna be misunderstood because taxation is like a huge issue. And, but anyway, the point is the social lottery is different than the natural lottery. Your fate in life. Now, lest any of you think, who knows what the most unfair social lottery in the world is? the social lottery that has the most to do with your life chances of any other social lottery. Does anyone know? It's not race or class. That's where your mind is going. Yeah, Matt. Maybe geography, like where in the world you're born? Yes, yes, exactly. You're all damn lucky, most of you, not all of you, 80% of you are American citizens. Just the mere dumb luck that you were born in the United States has conferred upon you advantages far exceeding those of any human being ever alive. And I think we forget that. You know, we're so obsessed with differences within our own society, we forget how the big determinant is, the, is that we were born in the United States. And the foreign citizens here, of course, are most of them are special draws from foreign populations anyway. But that's the main determinant. There are very few people at Yale who come from truly impoverished backgrounds in Africa or, or Asia or, or Latin America. Some do, but the very few. So this is the main determinant, the main social lottery. And you could ask yourself why that is the case. Why we don't take America's wealth and give it to the world, for example. Why, why should it be that you know, if you're born here, you get these advantages? Or if you're a child in Afghanistan, your life, a girl, if you're a girl in Afghanistan, your life prospects are completely different than if you're a girl in the United States. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Thank you, we'll continue next week. Thank you.